And welcome to AV Nation Live. This is the inaugural show of The Lighting Guy. I'm your producer, George Tucker. The host of this show, that is one J.P. Padel. He is the author of the blog The Lighting Guy, somebody I've been following for quite a while, and he is going to talk about lighting, integration lighting, a little theatrical lighting probably, but this show, we're going to talk about what that's about. Let me introduce you guys to J.P. Padel. Hey, everybody. Um, that's that's me. Um, if you've been... I've been on Twitter now for, I don't know, I, they gave me my little Twitter birthday thing a few months ago, and it was, I think it was five years, or I don't know, it was a long time. And I've been blogging, tweeting, and Google Plusing, and every other form of social media in about lighting for a long time. Um, when George came to me and asked about the idea of doing a podcast, um, I thought it was a great idea, because I think what we're seeing with lighting today is that it's not... Um, the revolution isn't in necessarily in luminaire design, although there's a lot of technology that's changing in luminaires. LEDs are obviously changing everything. But what we're really starting to see is that lighting is moving from being a component of the built environment to being integrated into entire building design. So we used to think of all these sort of building systems as their own silos. Your lighting system sat over here, your HVAC sat over there, audio, video, they were all separate components. Today, that kind of uh, that lack of integration is just not acceptable for most end users. Most clients are looking for an integrated system that uh, that creates entire environments. And so, the the theme of the podcast is really going to center in around why we how we can integrate lighting better, um, how we can achieve better results and outcomes for our uh, our clients and for our end users through lighting design that integrates into entire building systems. And I'm a, a big sustainability advocate and kind of a freak on the subject, so we're going to talk a lot about how we can do this in a sustainable way that reduces your energy loads and actually um, uh, it becomes beneficial on multiple levels. So I prepped a, a, a little slideshow. It's not, I promise that it's not going to be death by PowerPoint by YouTube or extension. Um, so George, let's, let's, uh, let's fire that up and Let's take a look. Give me one sec. Start sure, sure. Start. There we go. All right. <laughs> and I'm going to ask everyone to forgive me because my system is being a little quirky tonight, so you're going to see not a full screen. All right. So I wanted to start off for anybody that hasn't been following me on Twitter, and here's a little something that's a little confusing about my nomenclature. If you want to follow me, it's at James Bedell. Um, which is my full name, which is what I've been tweeting under for a long time. Um, and we talk about lighting there all the time. My website's jamesbedell.com, which is where the blog lives. Uh, so feel free to, to connect with me in those places. We can delve into what your specific questions are a little more. But if you take a look at the next slide, you can get a little bit of a sense for me. Um, I have a, a pretty varied background. I've been in the business about 15 years. I hung my first light at 17 years old. Um, and that was I was a theater guy. I was the sort of nerdy kid in, in high school that wanted to know how to make it snow for a Christmas carol or you know build a, a grease lightning for, for the musical. Um, so I, I took that and I moved into theatrical lighting in college and, um, and beyond. So I did a lot of off and off Broadway shows. I did everything from 20 little 20 seat black boxes all the way up to you know 800 seat houses. Um, Today, my, my primary work in the theatrical community is tied to the Broadway Green Alliance. Um, the Broadway Green Alliance is an offshoot of the Broadway League. We work with the NRDC and some other organizations in sustainable theatrical production. So we've launched a greener lighting guide. We've uh, helped the NRDC craft a guide for around sustainable uh, production work and design. And we're having an event on April 21st, and we can talk a little more about that when it gets closer. But... Um, when I moved through theatrical lighting, I moved into uh, from there. I moved into architectural work, and that's really where, working on high-end residences and some commercial projects, I started to see this the linkages between the two concepts. I, I what I love about theatrical lighting is that it's at its core, it's the most pure form of lighting design in the sense that you're creating a, an environment from nothing. You get to paint the entire scene, and it's all about creating a visual. But if you take some of those concepts and move them into architectural lighting, you can see that you're starting to create environments. Um, 
for myself, I worked in you know, high-end residential, as I said, some, uh, a lot of commercial work, uh, retail, for Abercrombie and Fitch, and for a few other places. And um, and then I ported those two pieces of, of uh, experience, and it moved into special event lighting, and that's everything from editorial events to brand activations, parties, you know, the sort of things that, that corporations do that, that tie into their marketing efforts. And that sort of drew on both my architectural background and my theatrical background. What all this means for AV and integration is that um, I've seen it work in a number of different ways. Uh, I've seen it work on a purely entertainment bit level. I've seen it work where it has to be functional, where you're trying to drive either presentation content or, or some other form of content in, light, in line with your lighting scheme. And I've seen it where it needs to be a brand activation. Like we did a, a, an event for Wired Magazine, as a, for instance, where we used an Xbox Connect as the driver for um, people would get up on a platform and dance, and someone wrote some a, a piece of software that the Connect would see that, project their their sort of polygon form on a big screen, and we could trigger lighting effects from that. So I, we've sort of run the gamut with what, what we're capable of. Um, Let's see that next slide. Give me a second. No and to those watching at home, you may have not seen the first slide, so we're just going to hold it there for a second. It's having a trouble today. Google Hangouts is a lovely thing, but sometimes. <laughs> uh, tell me something about the last uh, picture in this slide. Where is that? So that was a found space. Um, hmm. I, uh, I did quite a bit of marketing events for, or quite a few marketing events here in New York, and a lot of these. Uh, what happens is an event marketing company will lease out a like a retail space that's not being used. They'll do a short-term lease on it, and they'll use it for, in this case, that was a, a party I did for uh, the Oxygen Network. Mm. And it, it was a party and launch event salt and Pepper performs, and the guy from The Bachelor was there. It was that kind of a like a press event, basically. And that all of that was trust that we brought in, and we installed, and then we did, uh, you know, a, a bunch of color changing LEDs mm. and a bunch of other pieces of, of collateral um, to light all the collateral, I should say. Neon light boxes, and it's amazing. These the the editorial events and the marketing events that I've worked on run the gamut in terms mm. of budgeting. Um, some they want to be in and out; they want to spend you know sub ten thousand dollars and and just get it done. Others, they're you know. I worked on an event once where the client actually spent thirty thousand dollars to get four G. Uh, 4G internet signal down to uh, the basement of a hotel. So hmm. it's it's amazing where the money goes sometimes, but it's, yeah. uh, it definitely varies. Well, that's cool. It looks like a lot of those spaces in New York. It looks almost like the MetPav uh, Metropolitan Pavilion. Yep, yep, yep. It does that as well. But all right, so let's move on. We're going to the next one. Yeah, so I mean, this is just some of the places where I've uh, I've written and shared before. The the official blog is over on jamesbill.com, the Tumblr page, uh, Twitter is where I'm probably most active on social media. So if that's where you want to want to keep up with random lighting musings, that's where you can find me. And I've been published in a bunch of in a bunch of some magazines and, and some places. So I've been writing about lighting for a long time, and it's it's evolved quite a bit since uh, since I started. I remember when I. When I first got started, there really only was you know the six inch or the six by Lico and uh, and the Source Four, and now the 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 market for even just theatrical gear has exploded, and that says nothing about uh, nothing to say about architectural. Uh, this this is really the theme. If I had to boil down this slide here, this this slide is sort of the theme for the podcast, as far as I'm concerned. Lighting is about more than illumination today. Which is a funny thing to say. It doesn't necessarily, you know, the words in combination don't necessarily ring easily. But what I'm trying to get at when I say that is, lighting can promote healing, lighting can promote productivity, lighting can promote, um, you know, increased sales if it's a retail environment. It can become experiential. So it's not simply about delivering enough foot candles to a space. And this is, these are three verticals that I, I uh, pulled out to sort of talk about this in a little more detail. But I'm not going to read a slide to you. You can, you can <laughs> read it yourself. But there's really three things that, that jumped out to me were you know, the retail market, uh, healthcare, and religious. And when I, to boil all these words down, and, and we'll make this available for download uh, if you want to look at it in more detail. But 
in retail, it's all about brand experiences. When I worked for Abercrombie, it was all about creating a, a, a solid brand experience, for better or worse. A lot of people said, why is it so dark in here? <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a brand experience that you come away with a very solid memory of. And when we want to talk about integration with AV and talk about lighting control systems, it's about how can you create a retail environment that people are going to leave um, remembering uh, everything about it, and not just every, not just everything about it, but the brand, and focusing on key areas and key products. Healthcare is an area that I am very very passionate about from a lighting standpoint. Um, I'm a huge believer in better outcomes through lighting design. Specifically, um, to give a couple of examples, if you provide patients, we have studies on this, and we're gonna these are the kinds of things we're gonna get into in real depth in future episodes, but we can get into depth on what the sort of outcomes are when you start to introduce dimmable lighting to patients in uh, either an inpatient or an ambulatory care facility. What happens when you introduce backlit art pieces and colored, uh, and colored varying color to a healthcare space? And we start to see better sleep, we start to see better rest cycles, we see better uh, outcomes in terms of patient healing and less time in the hospital, which is I mean, obviously, it's great for clients, and that's what we want to see for patients, but if you get beyond patients, it, the hospitals themselves love this because it reduces cost. And I hate to say this, but the bottom line is great outcomes for patients and reduced time in the hospital mean, I mean healthcare facilities that are more profitable or at least are you know treading water in this sort of really difficult healthcare environment we find ourselves in right now. So better design for our healthcare spaces is... And integration with AV technology is a way to improve patient outcomes in a really, really strong way. Religious spaces and uh, uh, meditation and, and celebratory spaces are a whole other vertical, and they're, they have a whole different set of concerns and issues. One of them, surprisingly enough, is actually energy savings. Um, we don't necessarily think of that in a religious environment, but a lot of these facilities are running... Yeah, they're running 12 to 15 hour days, and you know that's a huge burden on uh, institutions that are often financially strapped. The other thing to think about, with uh, depending on the size and scope of, of a system that's going in a celebration space or religious space, is you know what kind of a show is not the right word, but what kind of a presentation are you trying to make to your 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 community? Um, what we can, see, what we're doing now is we're finding lower and lower cost, easier and easier ways to integrate lighting control systems and, and color changing and projection and all of the bells and whistles that you might see in a full blown theatrical environment are coming to religious spaces. And we, the folks that anyone that's watching this show or is going to watch the podcast, is, you guys are well aware of that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But what we're finding is that even your architectural fixtures can. Have be embedded with these kind of qualities. We can tie back zero to ten diving on your down lights and your track lighting, and make it a complete theatrical experience. And it can all happen in ways that if you've got an integrator, that's great. If you've got an end user that needs to run this for mass on Sunday, that's great too. This is uh, uh, all about sustainability, and so I, I mentioned at the start that I uh, I'm a passionate about this subject. I wrote an ebook called Losing Edison. And that was all about uh, residential lighting and sustainability opportunities. I've since taken the book down, mostly because technology's updated so much since the book first came out two years ago that it's it's no longer, you know, technologically relevant. It needs to be updated. But the core concept of the book, and and my, my core concept is that lighting is the low hanging fruit of any sustainability effort. It is the easiest for end users to understand because if you're if you've got 10 fixtures burning, say, 100 watts today, and you can do that with 50 watts tomorrow, the, the savings are very clear. There are incredible rebate and incentive programs across the country to, to activate these, these retrofits. And we've got sources now with LED that are radically more uh, energy efficient. But it's not just the efficiency that matters, for or I think, for our conversation. What matters to me is that LED is also inherently dimmable, where other energy efficient solutions like metal halide and fluorescent are not. So what you can do now is you can create beautiful environments 
it's not a matter of simply dimming the lights or shutting them off in a fluorescent situation. It's a matter of creating entire scenes that can shift. So it goes all the way back to that theatrical concept, that idea that you can actually change the lighting through better dimming, through better control. We can do that whether it's a religious environment, whether it's a theatrical environment, a healthcare space. I mean, the idea that all the hallway lighting in a healthcare space dims down to 50% after sundown, that's not done typically now, but it's we're seeing it in some of the forward-thinking healthcare facilities because it's a low-cost solution, it saves energy, and it improves patient outcomes. So it's, it's right there for us to, to deal with. Daylight harvesting, uh, I mentioned on here, and also smart controls, ox sensors, timing, and photo cells. We'll get into that stuff in more depth. I've got a couple of control experts that I want to bring on to interview and talk about it in, in ways that you know far exceed my own knowledge on the subjects. But my, if I, there's one thing that I can talk about in this podcast that I think is important, it's that these things are not as difficult to achieve as they once were used to be that technology was so difficult to work with that uh, no one specified it. Now you can do this with out-of-the-box solutions that I think are really, really um, key to the market. So here's just a short list of stuff that we're going to be talking about. I touched on some of these already, but you know we're going to get into some of the real you know, nitty-gritty issues, things like specifying LED. So how do you assess a lumen pa when you're looking at the cut sheet from a product that you see? How do you look at the lumen packages? What's the what's the what's a good way of sort of visualizing what a lumen package is going to look like? What's color temperature really mean? What's CRI really mean? What do they mean in concert? How do the warranties work on a lot of these products? What's going to work for your for your, your client at the end of the day? I want to talk about communicating lighting concepts and and you know, this is another one of these lists. I don't want to read everything off to you. You can read it yourself, but. Are you sketching? Are you doing renderings? We can do dial like I'm a big fan of dialogues. We can do a dialogues demo and sort of talk through some of these um, how that system works and how you can sort of render things yourself with free software. Uh, productivity studies. We've got some really interesting studies coming out of several places, Berkeley Lab and a few other places, that show that great lighting also increases office productivity and you can integrate it into control systems so that conference rooms and media centers all work in concert and it looks like a finished product. It's not something thrown together. There's nothing more irritating to me than when uh, you go into a conference center that you know the end user spent a lot of money on and they can't get the projector to work. They can't get the lights to dim when, <laughs> when they're supposed to. The shades don't move. I mean, there's there are so many ways that we can, we can dive into that. Uh, creating lane control strategies. I spent the entire day doing this today with a few different clients. I took around a, a vendor of mine and uh, we talked a lot about what really matters isn't so much the technology. People want to start from what do I buy? What matters is what are your end results? Um, and we have a whole slew of sustainability topics that uh, I'm going to dive into when we as we move forward. You know, and to that point, James, I want to make sure that people understand uh, when they see this list, if they have a question, they can send it to me or to Ask AV Nation on Twitter or to the various AV Nation sites that people know about. Uh, just as they see this list, they can do that, and we will cover them in eventual series. Your question may not go answered the first or second or third episode, <laughs> but sometimes it may take a while. We'll get there, definitely. Absolutely, and, you know, I, I, this is a top, these are a list of topics that I think are somewhat top of mind in the industry, mm -hmm. but... If um, if something's really jumping out at, at everybody, please let me know. I mean, you know, the, the Twitter handle's out there. You can feel free to reach out to me directly. I would love to put this on the topic list and sort of order them in a way that makes sense for the audience. Because if you guys have specific topics that are really jumping out at you, let's let's dive into them. Yeah, and we can do that too as a how-to. And hey, I have this specific case scenario, or you know, everything yeah. from how a three-way switch works to. What uh, what Fresnel I need to use on the lighting for X application? Right, Did I say right. That right? <laughs> Did I say that right? Uh, yeah, you know. Um, I, mean, I sold okay. lighting for a little while for another company, but uh, right. But, but but there you go. So here's the question, right? So AV Nation has a large audience in the integrator world. That means the AV guys who got into, say, maybe doing some alarm systems, got into doing HVAC a little bit with the thermostats and all the controllers, and then lighting became the thing. Everybody was doing lighting. Companies like Crestron and AMX and even uh, some of the remote central guys, and um, they are making actual 
lighting products, dimmers and cabinets and fixtures and right. that kind of stuff. And that leaves the AV guy going, I know audiovisual. Right. And I know that, okay, putting a light that splashes right on the screen, bad. Right. But making lighting for the environment, I don't know so much about. It's sort of like art. I know right. what I like, but I don't know how to tell you what I like. Right. So right. my question to you, after seeing your website and all the concept drawings, and people, if you're out there, the lighting guy, it's at uh, jamesbedell.com, right? That's right. Yep. Um, it's wonderful concepts that really do evoke that whole scenario of what it takes to be a lighting person and what you need to understand. Sometimes it's abstract, sometimes it's conceptual, but it is there. So my question to you is, let, let's start with um, what are the very basic things I as an AV guy getting into doing lighting would need to know? Well, let's start off with how do I even start to design a system? Well, r really the first question you have to ask is what, um, what is the end purpose of the space that I'm, I'm designing? Mm -hmm. right? That's, you really have to start back at the very beginning. So sometimes you know, we all come into these situations differently. Sometimes it's new construction, sometimes it's a retrofit, a new tenant in the building, whatever. Um, assessing the goals of the end user, or and sometimes the end user is a property owner, right? So you're doing a, a space that's for lease. You can have multiple tenants in the space, and the property owner is really your guy. The uh, point is, is that once you start to know what kind of a space you're dealing with, and that's where you can start to design out the system. Okay, great. So now let's, for argument's sake, say that you're doing... Um, you know, a mixed-use office building. So you're going to have some open office areas, you're going to have some private offices, and you're going to have some conference areas. Great. So there is roughly a half a bajillion architectural fixtures in the world. So how do I start to, to dive into what, what I need here? Great places to start are looking at the, the IES, right? So the Illuminating, the Illuminating Engineering Society or IESNA, because we're in North America, or I imagine most of the audience is in North America. They're going to lay out some of the things that you need to think about in terms of foot candle levels, in terms of contrast ratios, the sorts of things that make an environment comfortable. We all have sort of a sense for what kind of lighting we're used to seeing in these spaces, um, but that's just because that's how it's always been done, right? So we, like, when we imagine an open office, we think about two-by-two two fluorescent fixtures that sit over the desks, because that's what we always see. So then you call your distributor, and you say, hey, I need a two-by-two two fluorescent fixture. You're going to get the same fluorescent fixture that everybody else has ever gotten. So if you're trying to do something that's integrating to your system, let's think about what your outcomes want to be. Do you need it to be dimmable? Do you need it, what kind of color temperature are you looking for? All the sort of key metrics that, um, that go into making a system. So where do you start? You start with getting a little bit educated about what's available in your market. So that could be talking to your local distributor, it could be talking to your local rep agencies, and seeing some products. Once you start to see a couple of products, you start to see what you like and you don't like. So one of the ways to think about that is, and this goes into that LED specification conversation, but this is any fixture. How much light does it put out? What color is that light? And what distribution is that light? Those three big things will start to steer you where you want to go in terms of what you're putting together as a system. So if you know it's putting out, say, 2,000 lumens and it's in an 8-foot ceiling, great, how much light am I getting on my, ta my tabletop? That's where you start to look at cut sheets, start to learn how to read these, these pieces of data, and you'll get a sense for the light levels that you want to create. So it's a, it's a, a mixed thing because you need a little bit of experience and you need to know... Um, and you need to know a, or get a sense for uh, how fixtures accomplish different goals. One of the things I encourage you to do is um, we've got links out there to go. You know, if you just, just Google ISNA, so just that that phrase or, inter or international engineer or oh, sorry, illuminating engineer society. You get out there, you Google that group, and what you're going to find is links to a bunch of basic information and then stuff that you can go pay for. You don't need the stuff you can go pay for right just at the moment. What you need is to get a sense for what are some of the basic pieces of information out there about looming counts and a couple other things. A couple other terms to, to just Google. You don't even have to go to a specific organization, just terms you should be aware of. What's a lumen, right? I would Google the lighting facts label. That's a label from the Department of Energy. 
It looks kind of like a nutrition label, but it's for lighting fixtures. You'll see a picture of it, and it'll explain in really basic terms color temperature. It'll explain in really basic terms lumen output and color rendering or color quality is what I think they call it. Um, another thing to do is if you go to my website, if you go to jamesbiddell.com, right at the top of that, that bar, what you'll find is a, a link to a subsection called Losing Edison. And that is a series of white papers and, and individual web pages that I've uploaded that explain some basic concepts. So what the hell is color temperature? What's color rendering? What are some basic concepts in ambient lighting, in accent lighting? The sort of terms that you're going to see thrown around a lot by lighting people. So a great place to start is what's, a ambient, well, what's ambient, what's accent, what's task, and what's decorative. Those four layers of light are what you need to create a great lit space, a well lit space. So let's I'll give you a, the five minute rundown of what those are. Ambient lighting, that's your base coat. Think about how much illumination you need in a given space. So if it's a residence, it's obviously a lot different than if it's a church or if it's an office space. That base coat and how you create it is your ambient light level. So in an office like we're talking about, maybe what you have there is a series of linear troughers that each create a sort of balanced light level. You want that to be dimmable, so it reacts at different times of day. What's accent lighting? Accent lighting is a very is a misunderstood term in the industry. People call things that are pretty that you can look at, like a, a table lamp or a sconce or something. They call those accent lights. That's not accent lighting. <laughs> accent lighting is taking light from a given place. Maybe it's a ceiling, maybe it's a wall, whatever. Imagine a track light. This is the most sort of quintessential accent light. And the track light will shoot a light beam onto something that you want accented in the room. So if you try and create a focal point, let's take a church, you want to highlight you know, the altar or you want to highlight the pulpit. You're going to accent light that. In an office, well, where are we going to accent light in an office? What you're going to accent light in an office is, let's say, perimeter walls that have art or you want to do some highlights of different you know, quotes or different things, decorative elements in the space. That's what you're accent lighting. There's a lot of ways to create accent lighting. We can talk about that in future episodes. Uh, when it comes to decoratives, decoratives, those are the things that people look at and go, ooh, that's nice. It may or may not create functional ambient light, like a chandelier in a ballroom does both. It's decorative and it's also an ambient light source. But very often, it's a piece that people look at for beauty. It creates a, a focal point in the room. It's a design element, not necessarily relied on for, uh, for functional lighting. And the last thing is task lighting. Task lighting can be anything from a task light at a desk all the way to specific luminaries that are pointed at different focal points. Think about like a surgical area. Those are task lights. They happen to be mounted in a ceiling and pointed at a surgery table, but it's a task lighting application. When you've got all four of those elements in a given space, you've got a well-lit space. How do you know it's not a well-lit space? When you go into an office and all they have are two by two fluorescence or two by two troughers. That's a flat, it's got ambient light, it's got enough light to work, but nothing special, nothing draws your eye, nothing sort of creates the balance and depth that you're used to seeing. If you have all accent lighting, uh, go into an Abercrombie & Fitch store and you'll see an example of all accent lighting. The product is lit, but the, fa the space feels dark, it feels like a cave, because you don't have an ambient balance. It's all that teenage mm -hmm. angst. It's, it is. It is. Go into a Hollister and you'll see teenage angst. That's what it is. I mean, go walk into a Hollister. It looks dark. It looks like a nightclub. You can see the product, but you can't see anything else. Take it to, you know, a space with no decoratives is just sad. And a space with no task lighting, listen, if it's an office space, if it's any kind of space that serves any, people think about task lighting and they think, well, like, if I'm designing a church, what's the task light? I don't know. If your minister has to read something, he needs task light. If your parishioners or your churchgoers need to read something, getting enough lumen, getting enough lumens on that piece of paper that they can so they can read and sing with everybody else, that's the task lighting. So you've got to balance those four concepts and find fixtures that do that. We can talk about specific qualities that you might look for in a given fixture, how it's going to dim with the rest of your system, how you're integrating in with larger systems. That's all down the road. But those four levels of light, those sort of concepts are what you need to chase after when you're doing the lighting design. Well, guys, I think we have our task list. We have our homework for the week, don't we? 
look, if you're an AV guy and you want to learn about lighting, all the companies that we have used in the past, except for those devoted only to audio, are getting into lighting in some way, right? We all know this. We know that's the next part of our business. We know that it's what they demand for energy. We know that they want to know about lead and ashtray and all the rest of those things if you're on the commercial side. Eh, no, somewhat on the residential side. But they also want you to be the one-stop shop for all that stuff, right? This is the guy who's going to tell you about that. JP is going to have a series of shows on the, a monthly on Aviation, mostly about what he thinks you want to talk about, but if you ask the questions, we're going to give you the answers. So, ask Aviation or on our website at aviation.tv. Send those questions in, and we're going to make you, maybe not lighting pro, but lighting savvy, at least to begin with. James, anything to follow up with before we end the show? No, I think we've we've covered everything. Listen, uh, feel free to email me. It's jp at jamesbedell.com. Feel free to tweet me at James Bedell. And uh, you know, let's get out there and tell me what you want to what you want to learn about. We'll start putting up some content real soon. Very cool. I'm very excited because I actually drafted JP after reading his blog for a number of years and went, you know what we need is a lighting <laughs> show, and we're gonna do it. So guys, if you want. Go to avnation.tv. Avnation.tv. We have things about ed tech. We have the 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 social media. We have the live life about live event staging. We have the weekly AV week, our flagship show. We have the AV app show. If it's an app and it's dedicated to audiovisual, these guys are going to review it. See it there before you buy, and you'll know. That's avnation.tv. This show, those shows I mentioned, and more. I am your producer, George Tucker. This is JP Bedell. He is your host of this show. Please tune in. Send us your questions. This has been The Lighting Show on TV.